my name is Rachel Kastner, and I'm a full-time resident here in San Miguel with my husband, Jorge, and our daughter, Nayeli. I've been in San Miguel for a little over three years, and uh, my passion in life's work is regenerative agriculture. I've been involved in uh, continual learning progress in organic agriculture over the past seven years. Um, I studied international area studies at the University of Oklahoma, which I am originally from Oklahoma, was born and raised there. Um, went to live and work in Af South Africa for a year after um, I graduated from university, and there is where I found um, agriculture being employed as an avenue of social change and a solution to global climate change. And since that time, about seven years ago, I've, I've dedicated myself to study and forming organic and regenerative agriculture. And it's been a learning experience for me, and um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to partner and work with a local organization here in San Miguel called Vida Organica. Most of you probably know Vida Organica as a store and restaurant, but we are also an educational um, body and have an educational forum. I'll be sharing a little bit more about what we do on an educational level locally here in San Miguel. But my message for you today is one of hope for the future, how, uh, how farmers can reverse global climate change. Our message at Vera Organica is this, that agriculture is a game-changing solution for global climate change. And our proposition for how this is taking place and how this is going to uh, resolve, not only mitigate, but reverse climate change, is that agriculture has the potential um, to greatly reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are being produced every year, as well as reverse climate change by um, drawing down billions of tons of carbon that are in the atmosphere back down to the soil from where it came from and where it belongs. So most of us know the gloom and doom story of our industrial food system and of agriculture at large. We know it as the culprit. It's responsible for deforestation, environmental degradation, soil loss, and uh, environmental destruction, pollution under a lot of ways with toxic chemicals, pollution of our food, uh, making farmers sick and consumers sick by the industrial inputs into this agricultural system. What a lot of us don't know is how greatly our global food system is contributing to annual greenhouse gas emissions. And when we look at the entire global food sector, we see that it is responsible for over half of global greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm going to share with you this, uh, these statistics here, the percentages of, of greenhouse gas emissions from the different sectors of the global food system. So we see agriculture accounts, this is tillage agriculture, accounts for 11 to 15%. Um, land use changes and deforestation, so lands and fields being cleared, uh, forests being cut to produce food, native prairies being tilled to produce food, this is another 15 to 18% annually. Processing and transportation is a large percentage, another 15 to 20%, and then also 3 and 4% due to the waste stream that's, that's produced uh, from this global food system. So, we, you know, the global food system in climate talks, agriculture is almost seen as this necessary enemy. We all know that it has this replication of, of negative effects on our environment and also on consumers, yet it's often not recognized and openly talked about as being a major culprit. And there's a couple of reasons why that is. One is that the uh, global industrial farming industry has bought out politicians and, and global world leaders. And the other is the sense of fear that we, we have to keep producing food to feed the world and that the industrial system is the only way that we can do that. But we've, we've got to overcome that fear. We've got to look at the science and the research that's um, coming out now. And we have a message of hope when it comes to agriculture and climate change. And this message is that agriculture is a major game-changing solution to climate change. We know that we have to stop emitting greenhouse gases. We have to get away from our dependence on uh, 
fossil fuels. But at the same time, that's not, that's not happening fast enough, obviously. So at the same time, we have got to reduce the amount of carbon that's currently in our atmosphere, and we've got to do it very quickly. We are currently at a level of 400 parts per million greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Largely, scientists have agreed that we need to get back down to 350 parts per million to avoid catastrophic uh, climate change. We're 50 parts per million past that 350 mark. Uh, so undoubtedly, <coughs> we are experiencing, and we're going to continue to experience uh, catastrophic climate events, climate events because of this change. And we've got to get this carbon back out of the atmosphere. So how are we going to do that? We're going to do this by um, creating a global movement, changing our agricultural system to a regenerative organic production systems, and pulling carbon back to where it came from, back in, into the soil and where it belongs. So how does this happen? Um, I would like to introduce what is regenerative agriculture. Most of you are familiar with what organic agriculture is, which means the absence of synthetic chemicals, fertilizers, and genetically modified organisms. Regenerative agriculture goes a step further and uh, works with nature to use photosynthesis and healthy soil biology to draw down greenhouse gases while producing as much food as possible in a way that revitalizes soil rather than depleting it. I like this quote from a regenerative farmer that says, farming like the earth matters. And I have a great uh, uh, graphic here to share with you. We know that plants through photosynthesis draw carbon out of the atmosphere and uh, use this carbon for their above ground plant growth. Part of this carbon is respired or exhaled back into the atmosphere, but around 40 to 20% of the carbon absorbed from the atmosphere from green plant life is uh, emitted into the soil through its root systems, primarily in the form of sugars. So plant roots uh, through photosynthesis pull down energy from the atmosphere. They release this energy into the soil and this energy released into the soil has a very dynamic and important relationship with soil microorganisms, primarily bacteria and fungi. This relationship between the energy that comes from plant roots and the soil microorganisms locks carbon into the soil in long-term storage. So what we're talking about is every single green leaf, every single green plant, every single green tree has the ability to pull carbon from the atmosphere and store it into the soil long term. We've known about this for a while, right? That's why we've been talking about reforestation as a solution to global climate change. But what we're currently learning now is how scalable this movement is because of the interaction with soil microorganisms and plant life and how this relates to not only forestry, but to all forms of agriculture, which makes this movement much more scalable and necessary. So as the sugars come down into the soil, they're feeding microorganisms, we have essential nutrient exchange happening. And the word regenerative means that these systems are creating their own nutrients. They're generating their own nutrients so that they do not need external inputs for uh, plant uh, fertilizers and nutrients, plant minerals, because the uh, intricate interaction that's happening between the plant and the soil microorganisms is creating nutrients for that plant, which creates a regenerative system that's extremely resilient. And we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of that resiliency. So the carbon that's then emitted into the soil becomes locked into the soil um, potentially for centuries, uh, which is huge news for us. Um, we're learning that uh, over millions of acres worldwide, we can lock so we can lock carbon into the soil long term. I want to share a short video with you from an organization called Kiss the Ground, which is a partner of uh, Regeneration International and also the Organic Consumers Association. 
they put together a fantastic video that really um, explains very well this process. Do you feel hopeless about climate change and the damage we are doing to our planet? I did. But then I was shown a new way to look at the problem, which made the solution so obvious and so within reach. A solution that's right under our feet. Climate change is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon's not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it. It's us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools of where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool. Then we burned it for energy, putting it into play, disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon from the soil and biosphere into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. Now, the oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, which is resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course, we have to stop releasing fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get this cycle back into balance? Well, remember when I said that the solution is right under our feet? It literally is. It's the soil. Plants with sunlight and water perform photosynthesis. They pull in carbon from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of those sugars down through their roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build soil. Voila, carbon moves. Plants pump it in and soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost sets up an ongoing positive feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. In concert with other regenerative practices like not tilling the soil, planting trees, cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain gigatons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. And there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient-rich, full of life, and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone that eats. Remember this. The way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into the atmosphere or it pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. So I love that video. It's such a great overview of the situation. And, and, there, and it's exactly encapsulating the message of hope that, that we're talking about rolling out on a global level. So we know we've had a look at this natural system that sequesters carbon. And I want to talk a little bit more about what that actually looks like on the ground and what that actually looks like rolling this movement out on a global scale. So um, I think it's important to look at some of the numbers. When we look at sequestering carbon in the soil, uh, our soil currently holds 2,500 billion tons of carbon compared to our atmosphere, which is only 800 billion tons. Plant and animal life, 650 billion tons. 
And scientists estimate that since the dawn of agriculture, we've released 50 to 70 percent of the original carbon stock in our soils, which is primarily gone up into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So we see our soils are a massive carbon sink, and we have the potential of returning all of this carbon back to the soil because we let it all out, right? So this is a half-empty carbon sink that's readily available to us. And when we look at other forms of sequestering carbon through geoengineering, realistically, we can see that the soil is a much more readily available, economic, and we like to say shovel-ready, it's ready to go solution. So this doesn't require um, complex geoengineered systems to pull carbon out of the soil. We're doing it with nature. So how much CO2 are we actually talking about? What scale are we talking about? <laughs> uh, from measuring uh, regenerative agricultural systems and seeing how much carbon they're actually pulling down every year, we can estimate that regenerative agriculture can sequester 100% of current human greenhouse gas emissions or greater. So if we were to say that we're going to roll this out on a global scale, say we're going to put the 4 billion acres of croplands and pastures in regenerative management, 14 billion uh, acres of rangelands, and 10 billion acres of forests. If we did this, we could reduce our atmospheric carbon back to 350 parts per million in under five years. So we would be pulling 50 parts per million out of our uh, global atmospheric greenhouse gas emissions in under five years. This would be an idyllic situation where the entire world would stop exactly what they're doing and, and, and turn over to regenerative agriculture, right? But looking at this idyllic situation, we can see the scale and how important this is. Not only is it important, it's going to become necessary when we look at the effects of global climate change. So, why is regenerative agriculture a big deal? It's scalable. A third of the Earth's surface is an arable land that is uh, mostly under agricultural production currently. So, uh, the oceans are not available for sequestering any more carbon in the oceans. It's toxifying our oceans as it is. And so our largest sink available is soil. It's readily available. Farmers, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, are already using these methods worldwide. And the scientific, scientific community and the global community are really beginning to pay attention and give an ear to the research that's coming out of these systems and saying, and they're recognizing, this is a really big deal. We're also, uh, Regenerative agriculture, we're seeing that it's necessary for food security and a changing climate. But the industrial food system, the way that it's producing food today, cannot withstand global climate change. It is not resilient to drought, to flooding, uh, to temperature changes. And we're going to talk a little bit about the far-reaching benefits of this regenerative agricultural system. Not only is it a solution for climate change, but it has a domino effect of beneficial uh, changes for local communities, for global poverty, for local economies, for local environment. So as we see, our, our regenerative agriculture is the most accessible large-scale method of sequestration at our fingertips. So what are we actually talking about here? What do regenerative farming methods look like? And what are farmers using today on a large scale to do this? One of the regenerative farming techniques used is no-till or minimum-till agriculture. Currently, in the United States, in the industrial uh, agricultural system, 20 to 40 percent of our agricultural system is currently using no-till agriculture. So what does no-till agriculture mean? It means that uh, implements are used, tractors are used, instead of turning soil over, which oxidizes any carbon that's been pulled down into that soil and releases it into the atmosphere, Instead of opening up this uh, soil and releasing carbon dioxide, the soil surface is maintained and implements are used to put seeds in the soil without opening the soil, without churning the soil, without moving it. And this has several beneficial effects. The first is that carbon is not released. 
The second is that the organic material that is in the soil doesn't become oxidized, so it acts uh, improving soil structure, improving soil water holding capacity. And the third, again, is uh, going back to the microbial life that's in the soil. Instead of being oxidized and basically killed through tillage agriculture, that biological community is able to stay alive in the soil and form those beneficial relationships with plant roots so that more carbon is sequestered. So as I was saying, there's 40% of agriculture in the United States, industrial agriculture, is using no-till agriculture. And why? This has primarily been put into place through uh, natural resources and conservancy agencies in the United States for uh, soil conservation, because when we come in and we till the soil and then rains come, all that soil, not all soil, but a huge percentage of that soil washes off of our field into our lakes and rivers. And farmers are finding that their rain and irrigation goes longer when they don't till the soil. So the organic material that's conserved in the soil, the soil structure that's created by plant roots and soil microorganisms helps create greater water holding capacity, which in the Midwest and the United States is becoming essential for their production systems. In the past five years, they've seen severe droughts, and they have found that a no-till system is improving the water holding capacity of their soil, and so they're using it. Now, a disadvantage of the industrial agricultural system using a no-till agriculture that's not organic is that they primarily use herbicides to remove weeds. Because if you're not coming in and tilling the soil, you have weed pressure coming from the soil. So they're in non-organic systems, they're drenching the soil with herbicides, which is then going down into the water systems, running off some you know, lakes and streams, contaminating foods. So not only is it no-till that regenerative is saying, but organic. And there's ways that we can that we can do this. So here is a, a picture of a no-till agricultural system. You can see the residue from the previous crop in between the row of the green plants. So you have all this organic matter that has intact roots into the soil and also organic matter above the soil that's acting as a mulch, that's acting as a, a layer keeping soil moisture in. Those roots are decaying, dying in the soil, further feeding uh, the microbial life in the soil. Another essential element of regenerative agriculture is recognizing the soil as a biologically active living organism and recognizing that the microorganisms, the fungi and bacteria in the soil are essential for carbon sequestration. Because even, even if you are using no-till agriculture, um, the biology, no-till agriculture is one step in the right direction. But if you're drenching your soil with synthetic herbicides and chemicals, that largely reduces the biological communities of microorganisms in the soil. Microorganisms are in the soil are killed off by synthetic uh, inputs. So when we talk about uh, synthetic fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus fertilizers, and also herbicides and pesticides, the microbial life um, in the soil can't coexist with these inputs. So again, it's not only uh, it's uh, the organic element of the system is absolutely essential in recognizing that for these microbiology ecosystems underneath the soil to be functioning, we have to uh, allow them to live and give them the proper environment to live, which is an environment that's not using pesticides and herbicides. Crop diversity and agroforestry is another method um, that regenerative agriculture is using, and as you can see, on a large scale. This is a farmer in uh, Wisconsin. His name is Mark Shepard. He has a 106-acre farm, and uh, he's developed his farm. It has 10 different uh, in products that come out of his farm, nuts, vegetables, grains, tree and uh, systems like this, as you can see, don't look like corn farms in Iowa. And they look more like natural systems. And one of the greatest lies that the industry has told the public 
that our politicians tell us is that organic agriculture cannot feed the world. We know that that's not true. There has been several studies done, and uh, the global and international community is really coming out and saying, um, you know, it's not true that organic agriculture can't feed the world. It can feed the world. In fact, our, these agricultural systems are more resilient. They provide better food security for rural communities throughout the world. And it's scalable. And what we see is, you know, Mark Shepard, there's hundreds of other large-scale regenerative agriculture farmers who are uh, doing designs like this all throughout the world, including here in Mexico. And it's, uh, these are people that understand natural systems, understand biological systems, and are very good business people. They understand how to make multiple businesses off of land. And it's all improving the environment, all improving local communities, economies and is essential for a way to move forward. Perennial grasses and crops. When we have greater root systems, we have more sugars going down in the soil, we have higher uh, microorganism communities in the soil, and we have higher carbon sequestration. And so uh, returning our grasslands, taking care of our grasslands and rangelands in a way that they're not overgrazed, that they're not undergrazed, but that the plants are stimulated properly by animals to create larger root systems. And then we also have other groups. Uh, the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, is a group that's working to breed a perennial grain crop. So uh, it would be, they're working, it's called Kernza, is the grain that they're working to produce. So the idea is that it, it's a perennial grass that never has to be cultivated perhaps mode, um, that produces grain that's edible for humans. So they're looking at creating a plant with this type of root system that's a highly productive, palatable grain for humans. And uh, they're, they're getting there. They're still several years down the road from, from making their products palatable. They have a product, but it doesn't taste very good. So they're working on breeding more desirable qualities in. But uh, I mean, that's, a, that's a huge potential for uh, creating a perennial grass system that also feeds feeds people. Planned rotational grazing of livestock, absolutely essential. We look at the amount of grazelands and grasslands worldwide. Um, you know, cows have been become again known as this culprit for land degradation, and uh, land conservationists have been forever trying to get cattle <coughs> off the land. What we're seeing now which farmers have been seeing for several uh, decades, is that properly managed animals can restore degraded systems. If we look at this picture, uh, the left side of the picture, as you can see, this is a high desert, dry environment. However, the left side of the picture, look at the amount of ground cover that there is. Look at the amount of diversity of plants that are existing there. And on the right side, you see basically bare ground uh, exposed soil, when the rains come, when the winds come, that soil is lifted off, and there's obviously no fodder for animals. Uh, the situation here on the left was created with animals. So both of these fields look the same. And uh, in this exact picture, I'm not sure how many years it took them to attain this amount of ground cover, but uh, Alan Savory with uh, his institute, he's a uh, Zimbabwean who in Africa realized that uh, land restoration could be achieved by moving large groups of animals, specifically elephants. And so he said, how can we, how can we return, regenerate our savannas? They've been totally overgrazed, uh, the soil's been totally depleted, we're, we're in desertification. And by observing nature, because he grew up in that environment in nature. He said, well, let's look at how animals move around. They move around in large groups, they move around together, and they don't come back to the same place until it's been regenerated. And so he started managing animals in this way and has developed an entire management system. It's called holistic management. And uh, we're seeing this used all over the world on billions of hectares, um, holistic management. And it's not only... Uh, it's regenerating broken ecosystems. It's not only maintaining uh, prairies as they should be, but animals can come into an environment that's completely stripped, like maybe this side on the right side. And because their manure is biologically active, it's 
putting biology back into the soil. Uh, it's putting a layer of mulch onto the soil. And uh, they're just that startup that a degraded soil needs, if properly managed, to recuperate itself. So absolutely essential, the potential. Again, this is a picture showing the difference in the same environment. The right side is holistically managed, rotationally raised animals. And the left side is an overgrazed field, which most of us are perfectly familiar with here in Mexico and also different areas of, of the United States. Another method of uh, regenerative agriculture that's uh, huge is compost application. The recent research has shown that a single application of half a half inch layer of compost on grazed rangelands significantly increases forage production by 40 to 70 percent, increases soil water holding capacity to up to 26,000 liters per hectare. That's a lot and increases soil carbon sequestration by at least one ton per hectare per year for 30 years without the application. So again, when we talk about scaling this movement up and uh, how significant this could be if we took a half an inch of compost uh, and applied this on a large amount of land, we're getting one ton more per year per hectare carbon sequestration, uh, which has the potential to be huge. The com why does this work? The compost that's applied to the surface soil, again, is activating that biological community. It's uh, putting more organic matter into the soil, holds water. The biological community needs water to function. Uh, it's providing an extra boost of uh, nutrients to plants. So healthy plants have healthy roots and healthy microorganisms in the soil. It's an the whole secular system that is feeding itself. So this all sounds great, right? We're going to heal the world. Uh, I want you to know that this is not just a theory, that this is happening, that it's happening on a large scale, and that globally people are really starting to pay attention to it. Uh, there's over 2,000 farmers in eastern, southern, and western Australia. Uh, who are adopting with a method known as pasture cropping. So that means you take your grassland and you come in and you plant corn or wheat or cotton directly into your pasture without tilling it, without turning it over. And so again, you have the grass that's acting as a cap on the soil, holding in moisture, holding in carbon. The roots are continually pulling carbon. Then you come in with your annual crop and plant into that grass. Uh, this is made possible usually with um, uh, animals being included into this production system. So before your annual crop is planted, animals will come in, a large herd of cattle, come in, eat the grass down, then you come in and you plant your annual crop of wheat. Your annual crop then is the seed is going into a carbon-rich soil, a nutrient-rich soil, bacteria, and fungi-rich soil, has amazing production, and you haven't tilled anything. And on top of that, you also have grass to bring your animals back into after the harvest. Um, this is being used all over uh, the United States and also in Australia, where it was really pioneered uh, by farmers who were dealing with highly degraded lands. Uh, let's see, the, the high crop yields from using pasture cropping uh, are up to four tons per hectare when oats are sown into grassland. So these are uh, production levels that by far outproduce their industrial counterparts. This is from uh, Alan Savory's Institute uh, called, uh, well, the Savory Institute. They're employing holistic management. So we can see here, this photo is actually taken in Mexico. In 1963 and then in 2003, this is the, the picture has been blended together. Uh, but this is grassland that's been put into holistic management. So if it were left as it were in 1963, it would have degraded further than this amount. But you can see the potential of ground cover, a diversity of grasses. Um, the trees here have been, have come back to life and they've planted more trees. And again, this is happening uh, over millions of acres in throughout the world. 
Uh, the same race needs gold to put 1 billion acres under holistic grazing by 2025. So they're a very strategic organization that's focused on scaling this large scale. This is again the photo of Mark Shepard's farm in Wisconsin. So what are the extending benefits of regenerative agriculture? We've talked about how it's a solution to climate change. But the great thing about this, as we look at any holistic system, is that uh, it has multiple extending benefits, uh, specifically for our environment. Um, one of the greatest things about having soils that are regeneratively managed is that their water holding capacity is greatly increased, like we're talking about with the no-till system. And as we've seen in recent years, global climate change is already happening, droughts and dramatic flooding is uh, affecting communities all over the world and agricultural production all over the world. And uh, the global water crisis is here and present. And when we have soils that are regeneratively managed, not only can they hold rainwater better, the water uh, recharge of aquifers is increased because instead of running off and carrying topsoil with it, the water is being absorbed into the soil because of the root systems, because of the tiny canals that these microorganisms <coughs> make into the soil. So that water is actually able to transfer back down into aquifers and uh, is able to largely alleviate uh, the global water crisis as it is today. Um, so the numbers on how uh, that water holding capacity is increased is capturing and storing an additional 27,000 gallons of water per acre for every 1% increase in soil carbon. So we can measure soil carbon and we can measure water holding capacity and water recharge and we see that that's 1% increase in soil carbon transfers to 27,000 gallons of water per acre. An acre is not that big. 27,000 gallons of water is a lot of water. So when we talk about our water crisis in San Miguel, the fact that uh, you know we're pumping water from very low groundwater systems because we're extracting it at such a high rate, and because of land use change, the water is not being absorbed back into those aquifers. So it applies to us here. Um, increase in crop production and resiliency. When we have regeneratively managed soils, we have higher nutrient values in the soils, and we have higher mineral values in the soils that are being regenerated from natural systems. In industrial agricultural systems that are dependent on tillage, that are dependent on synthetic fertilizers and inputs, it's true that if you take synthetic nitrogen and you pour it on a plant in the soil, that plant takes that nitrogen up and uh, grows and creates uh, fruit which could be corn or tomatoes or whatever it is. However, the nutrient quality of the fruit produced from a plant, only given synthetic inputs, is largely reduced than a plant grown in a biologically rich and healthy soil that not only is providing the plant the essential nutrients that it needs to grow, but it's also providing the plant essential minerals. Basically, like the industrial food system can just get by creating fruit by just giving the plant enough of these essential nutrients to create this perfect red plump apple. When we look at the nutrient content of that apple, it's largely degraded from what it was 50 years ago on our grandparents' farm. And so when we go back and we look at the soil, and if our soils are biologically active, if those microorganisms are making or breaking down minerals in the soil for the plant, then the fruit then carries those minerals. And so uh, when we talk about food security issues, um, creating nutrient-dense food is absolutely essential. These systems are creating that. Um, as well as systems that are more resilient for climate change. Again, any natural system, um, when we look at forests, when we look at wetlands, when we look at prairies, they are so biologically diverse that they have the capacity to recuperate and to regenerate after uh, catastrophic climate events. And these food systems that are being designed in the model of nature are also 
greatly more resilient in the face of global climate change. So when we have floods come in, when we have fires come in, when we have changing temperatures, instead of having a system that's based on inputs and a special seed that has to grow at a special temperature and has to have a special nitrogen fertilizer, we have natural systems that are talking to each other. So the soil organisms are talking to the plants and they're uh, creating different conditions for those plants to be able to recuperate and grow. The seeds, the generations of seeds are passing down environmental information um, from the plant generation to plant generation about changing climates and changing temperatures. And we see these natural systems are far more resilient uh, in the face of global climate change. Here's just another example of conventionally farmed land in India during drought. This is, uh, the next photo is taken at the exact same place, same land in India during drought, but after the introduction of organic regenerative agriculture. It doesn't even look like the same piece of land, but it's taken from the exact same place. And this is largely what we see all over Africa, India, Mexico, South America. This is what our landscape is turning into but we can turn into um, functioning ecosystem again. So there's more good news. Regenerative agriculture not only has environmental positive impacts, but it also has the capacity to, revert, to reverse global poverty and hunger. These extending social and economic benefits of regenerative agriculture include, as I was saying, more nutrient dense food for communities. Uh, we're removing toxic pesticides, herbicides, and genetically modified organisms from food and environments. So just simply providing people with clean, healthy food. These systems also restructure the global food system, returning work to small farmers. So uh, these systems generate a significant economic multiplier effect in the community, creating real wealth beyond the agricultural business. It demands more skilled labor through diversification of farming enterprises and improves economic resilience of farming operations through diversified production. So again, it's taking back um, the farmland to rural communities um, out of the hands of large corporate agricultural companies and back into uh, community production of farms. And this doesn't mean five acre farms here, 10 acre farms here. We're talking about large scale farms. So how are we going to scale up our global food system to regenerative agriculture? Uh, some important information that uh, has come to light uh, is that, you know, scientists and farmers have been aware of the soil's capacity as a carbon sink for many years. The studies that have been conducted measuring carbon in soils and the extending benefits of these are finally being heard on a global level. Uh, for the first time in December of 2015 at a uh, UN Climate Summit, agriculture was on the agenda as a major solution for climate change. So this is huge. Uh, one of the agreements that came out of the Paris-Lima agreements in December was uh, a French initiative, which is a four per 1,000. Uh, headed by the French Ministry of Agriculture, which says that a 4% annual growth rate of soil carbon would make it possible to stop the present increase of atmospheric CO2. And uh, multiple countries have signed on to the 4 per 1,000 agreement, including Mexico. And so everyone's diving in saying, how do we make this possible? We see the potential for uh, the effect of you know drawing down this amount of CO2. Let's make it happen. How do we roll this out on a global scale? And how do we involve our uh, ministries of agriculture? And uh, how do we educate them on doing this? How do we educate our farmers on these regenerative methods? Let's get it into practice. That's where everyone is at right now. Another necessary step in, in scaling this movement up is to just stop subsidizing a degenerative agriculture and incentivize regenerative agriculture. Uh, we're looking more and more into how do we measure how much carbon is being sequestered in soils through specific methods, what methods exactly 
qualify the rubric for what is regenerative agriculture is being developed as we speak so that we can qualify a farmer as a regenerative farmer. We can give them a certification, we can give them parameters for production, we can measure how many tons of carbon they're putting into their soil, and we can give them carbon credit for doing that as a service, uh, as a global service for pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. At the same time, making uh, this regenerative production more economical for the farmer. There's a lot of work to be done in that area as far as our studies. Uh, any biological system, it doesn't come in a nice, neat package of exactly how to measure carbon, but the studies are being done, the work is being developed. So who's going to carry this movement out? Small farmers. Currently, small farmers grow 70% of the world's food on 25% of the world's land. So when I talk about uh, going, returning back uh, to those small farmers, this is still within our reach. All the small farmers have not died off. In the United States, they left in half. But globally speaking, our small farmers are still there. A lot of them still have land. A lot of them are still producing food and are struggling to survive. Um, farmers and conscious consumers can feed the planet. So how do we build this movement? Connect all the dots. Uh, the great thing about what we see coming together right now with this regenerative agriculture movement, it's not just soil conservationists, it's not just uh, permaculture hippies that are into this idea. All across the board, activists uh, for health, environment, justice, peace, and democracy are saying, hey, this is a real solution and uh, we're going to start talking about it, we're going to start talking about governments about it, we're going to start developing global initiatives and programs to address it. And uh, connecting all these dots is absolutely necessary. And each one of you has your place um, in this movement as well, your connections to your own um, groups and, and activism that you're participating in. Part of our campaign strategy that uh, we have to recognize is, as I mentioned earlier, that we're currently subsidizing degenerative agricultural systems. And one of the biggest threats to a regenerative agricultural system is the hold on the industry that uh, industrial factory farms have. Uh, the amount of livestock that are uh, you know, produced inside of industrial factory farms by far controls uh, the industrial market in, in the Americas and in Europe. And we have to say, stop. These systems are sick systems. They're making our environment sick. They're making products that are sick. And uh, they're making consumers sick. And it's time that we say, this is, we're not allowing this anymore to happen. And really call it out for, for what it is. However, ranchers, cattle raisers, can be our greatest allies. As we see the potential for grasslands to sequester carbon, if we can get cattle ranchers on our side and there's beautiful relationships forming all over the Midwest and the United States of environmentalists and ranchers coming together, learning techniques for proper animal management on the grasslands, and farmers making more money because they have healthier grasses, they're able to put more animals on their land, and their lands are healthier. Uh, we have greater protection for soil erosion and uh, it's a symbiotic relationship there between ranchers and uh, environmental conservation and regeneration. So uh, we don't want to demonize the livestock industry. They can be our greatest allies. So let's work with them. Again, um, like I said, we have to call our industrial food system for what it is. Chemical intensive and capable of produced foods are not taking us anywhere good. We also need to push the organic community to go beyond the minimum of the USDA organic standards. Just because an agricultural system is organic doesn't mean that it's necessarily regenerative. True organic farmers know these regenerative methods and they're using them. Minimum tillage, cover cropping, uh, rotation of crops so that you have high biological communities in your soil. However, our organic standards don't necessarily include these regenerative practices as a standard. And so we need to push the organic community to start recognizing and start measuring are these production, yes, these production systems are organic, 
but are they regenerative? Are they healthy for the environment? And we need to make sure that those production systems aren't degrading our soils um, in any way. Become a leader in the movement. Each and every one of us have a place as a consumer. Um, every time we eat at a restaurant, every time we buy food for our family, every time we have a lawn or a garden, uh, we are all leaders in our own communities. And this movement is, is global and involves all of us. So we urge you to become a leader in this movement wherever you are. So our message today is that uh, climate, the climate movement offers bad math plus good and blue. But what we need is hope that we can reverse, not only mitigate climate change. If uh, regenerative agriculture is scaled up to the potential um, that it has, we're talking about pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere than annually we are emitting, which would be bringing our carbon dioxide levels down annually, reversing the effects of global climate change. I haven't heard of any other solution that's offered us that potential. Globalized the movement. Absolutely necessary that this movement becomes globalized, uh, replicated on large amounts of land very quickly. Uh, a new initiative that's that was started last year and launched at the Climate Talks in Paris this past December is an organization called Regeneration International, which is a group of world leaders of various environmental movements who have come together to solve problems in agriculture and climate change. Uh, some of the founding members are Ronnie Cummins from the Organic Consumer Association, Bandana Shiva, uh, Andrew Liu from iPhone Organics International, Han Taran from Millennium Institute, Steve Rye from Mercola.com. So we have some major political leaders, global leaders here, who are uh, come from all different sectors. We have from the health sector, we have from the agricultural sector, um, from the environmental sector, all coming together to say regenerative agriculture needs to be heard, focused on, developed, and uh, rolled out on a large scale. So I urge you uh, to go to the Regeneration International webpage. Uh, they've done an amazing job at pulling together articles, information, videos surrounding agriculture, climate, health, and uh, the environment related to uh, regenerative agriculture. And I have some information here. I take part with you so you remember their website, on their Facebook. Uh, it's an amazing place to educate yourself and your community with the information that's, that's um, coming out of these systems. So, you're part of your movement. As you know, you vote with your dollar, your political pressure on our uh, politicians and uh, who have largely been bought out by the industry, the large agriculture industry. It's time to put pressure on them and say enough is enough. Uh, we urge you to join the movement, and there's several avenues that you can uh, join this movement specifically. Uh, the United States, uh, based nonprofit, the Organic Consumers Association, uh, is a sister organization of the Organica, our Mexican-based organization. And uh, the OCA is comprised of over two million members. Um, it's a, basically an online grassroots uh, advocacy group representing uh, organic consumers in the United States. And uh, they're incredibly active uh, politically in the United States. And I urge you to, again, get connected with the Organic Consumer Association, their web page, and their newsletters. Um, locally, here at the uh, Via Organica in Mexico, uh, you mentioned earlier that we have a store and restaurant, but the other side of Via Organica is our educational side. Um, so we offer free workshops every week from our store location in Centro. We have a radio program once a week on Tuesdays that uh, goes out to all of our listeners and throughout the city and rural communities that talks about environmental issues, health issues, agriculture, and again, it's spreading this message through radio. Uh, we have an educational farm and ecological center uh, at our ranch, which is towards Jalpa, towards Queretaro, and then towards Jalpa. So at this farm, we're really developing a learning center for regenerative agriculture. And uh, we have a production garden, that's about two hectares, no, sorry, two acres, 
and uh, we also are developing our livestock program. Uh, we have some very exciting education happening at the farm for uh, local Mexicans, rural communities, also international students. Um, and it's really an exciting move for Mexico because uh, we're identifying all these different educational centers in Mexico. Alan Savory, the Savory Institute has several different hubs here in Mexico. There's lots of people practicing regenerative agriculture. And so the Ecological Awareness of Organica is uh, becoming a center point for all of these educational activities and really a voice internationally and locally here in Mexico for this movement. Um, and then with Regeneration International, as I mentioned, the wealth of information that they have there. Uh, they have an amazing uh, calendar of events so you can connect to local events that are happening in your area related to regenerative agriculture. So just a quote to conclude our time this afternoon. Regenerate means to give fresh life or vigor, to revitalize, to recreate the moral nature, to cause to be born again. And when we look at the state of our world, the state of our societies, political environments, our uh, environmental state, I think we can all agree that a regenerative approach is absolutely necessary and needed. And uh, it's an exciting message of hope that we're very grateful to share with you today. Thank you for your time. I have some uh, information here, I have specifically a paper uh, on soil carbon restoration and soil biology that really outlines in more detail how that cycle works and the benefits that come from the cycle. Also a few other uh, materials that have some information for you. And I'm open for any questions. Peas, a nitrogen-fixing bean, legume. 
and then they have a machine uh, that is called a roller crimper. So basically it's a giant machine that comes down and rolls down the crop and kills it. So instead of coming in and killing that cover crop or killing that weed crop through tillage, you're using a, a different machine to come in and kill that crop, but without disturbing the soil surface. And all the biomass, all of the beans that grew up, act as a mulch on top that you can then come in and plant. So we're talking about different planting methods, but they're still mechanical, and they're still able to be scaled up. Uh, for example, the pasture cropping that we were looking at, uh, the Australian farmers are doing, and again, they, they quit tilling the soil. They just come in and they plant their seeds right into the pasture. Um, you know, there's no one answer for every single uh, crop. Every crop is different. Wheat's different than corn, it's different than squash, right? The vegetables, it's much more challenging to produce them organically and no-till. It requires a, creating a different system for that specific crop. But especially on our grain systems, we're seeing uh, huge improvements by doing non-till systems, organic no-till systems. Does that answer your question? I would come here and then I'll come back. Yes. I come from the Rockies uh -huh. in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. My father was a rancher, farmer, uh -huh. whatever, and lots of other stuff. When you have your combine, if it's like a rake, it opens up enough for the seeds to go down. If you just plant it, it burns. The seeds will die. Okay. So, uh, Instead of tilling deep, 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 we used a combine that had a rake. Uh -huh. And I used to drive the old truck when I was five. My feet wouldn't hit the pedals. Uh -huh. It was in compound. I think it's still on the farm somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And my brother and father would change the irrigation pipes. Uh -huh. And what they're doing in Australia is what we've done forever. Exactly. Yeah. This was this is not brand this what, is granddad's farm. Exactly. Still there. Granddad's farm before the industrial evolution of synthetic pesticides, fertilizers, and herbicides, right? People and have forty the attorneys before. guarding the water. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes. So I live in Minnesota, and mm -hmm. my family farms in Iowa. Uh -huh. And when I bring up anything like that about this, yes. basically they talk about the fact that it's going to totally increase the price of all of our food to the point where it's not affordable. Uh, if they if they would even think about going to these methods of farming, uh -huh. sure. Um, plus, the the primary sources for their education about what to do with farming are two the companies that sell the products, but also the agricultural departments at the universities in these various states mm -hmm. and their extension services. Mm -hmm. Can you give me any hope that these, <laughs> that these universities and the extension services are beginning to teach the farmers how to do this different? You know, the, the <coughs> not a lot yet. <laughs> okay. I was, in, I was in a graduate program in, in Oklahoma State University, one of the largest agriculture universities, and I, I dropped out because I was my own advisor and my own independent studies because nobody was studying what I wanted to study, which was soil right. microbiology and its, its relationship with plants. So, um, however, I met a lot of soil scientists at those universities who knew the truth about what uh, agricultural systems were doing to the environment, about how soil really functions. And uh, the information is there, but like you said, these, uh, the land grant uh, agricultural schools have a very close tie to uh, the chemical companies that make yeah. the seeds and inputs for the industrial agricultural chemical system. So again, it goes back to, um, to political involvement and saying, calling out those uh, bought out relationships and uh, calling into light the scientific research that's out there that says there's other ways to produce food, there's better ways to produce food that actually can feed the planet, that can reduce poverty, that can reduce our water crisis, 
And so, and again, it's, it's telling, and a lot of it is telling the stories of success. I think is really important to your family. Um, do you, does your family have cattle? No, they don't have animals. It's total grain. Corn, wheat? Corn and soybeans. Corn and soy, okay. Yep. Yeah, and then another thing is why they see it as, uh, this is not economically viable, <coughs> they're being subsidized to produce corn mm-hmm. and soybeans. Right. So of course it's not economically viable. And maybe perhaps in their case, other farmers are finding it the organic soybean market in the United States? Are you kidding me? Um, and here in Mexico, we can't even get organic soybeans uh, nationally. Uh, a huge international market for organic feedstock. Um, so maybe it's not quite obvious to them that it's economically viable, uh, but I believe if they actually looked at it, that, that it might be. But then again, they're being subsidized to continue to, to produce in their degenerated um, system. And uh, I, you know, I think the relationship with with current conventional farmers is really important. They've been really demonized. They've been um, and all the farmers that I am from Oklahoma, I know a lot of farmers, I know a lot of ranchers, and all the you know industrial methods and tillage. Oklahoma is far behind the rest of the country as far as uh, using no-till. And you know, these are good people that love the land. They just they've been convinced this is the way to do it. And so we've got it. We've got to just tell, keep telling the story, keep passing the information, keep spreading uh, the the information that's out there, the studies that are out there about these extending benefits. And unfortunately, I think uh, I think a lot of us are going to have to get to a crisis situation before we make the change. And a lot of the ranchers and farmers that are using these alternative methods, these regenerative methods, have come to a crisis situation on their farm. And they said, well, I, I, I've got to change. I can't keep farming. So they make holistic regenerative changes, and, and it becomes economically viable for them because they regenerate their, their ecosystem so much that they have so much more production and resiliency. So, Thank you. Let's kind of get a clip, and then we'll come back. A little bit more about history. Yes. My family started well on the story, dugouts, milk to Oppenheimer, et cetera. Uh-huh. In the 40s, I remember my mother hating Roosevelt because he threw apples in the ocean. The people who make the laws don't know anything about agriculture. <laughs> That's the problem. The ranchers have to educate the people who make the laws. It's true. And of course later, with Teddy and all that other stuff, things gradually change. But as long as you are for subsidies, they never accepted a single subsidy, mm-hmm. ever. Yeah. yeah, there's a wealth of information in the farmers. And a lot of the farmers feel trapped, like they can't get out of the cycle. So because the cycle we get into by buying genetically modified seeds, they end up with soils that are dead. The, the regeneration of soils after using conventional farming methods with heavy synthetic inputs and heavy tillage is very possible to be very good to developments and make big houses. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> land change, right? Um, land use changes. But, uh, so those soils that are, that are conventionally farmed are basically dead. They are growing medium for plants that require inputs. All the biological activity in the soils is completely dead. And uh, it can come back, but it takes a little while. And it takes knowing how to manage them. And um, a lot of farmers become trapped in the cycle. They know that there's another way to produce. They don't want to use chemicals. They don't feel good when they use them. They feel sick when they use them. But yet they feel trapped. And they're in debt. You know, they've bought the newest combine that the seed company said they had to buy to plant their seed. So, you know, we've, we've got we've to support those uh, our farmers too that want to make changes, and that, that, like you're saying, they they know how to 